for those of you who know me, um, this photograph is kind of a concession because I love winter above all other seasons. Uh, I love the Nordic ski, and I'm finally agreeing and admitting that maybe we're moving on. This is a uh, photograph of the Kelso River on the north end of Sawville Lake uh, in the Boundary Waters, a place that my family has loved going for many years. Um, what I'm going to talk about as we go through this evening is going to be focused not as much on the technical aspects of care, on the surgical aspects, on the um, dental aspects, although we will talk about them in sequence, but it's more focused about how a team fits together and why it makes sense for taking care of these children. Every Wednesday morning, a group of people gather from across this campus, from over in speech language, hearing sciences in Shevlin Hall over by Town, to the School of Nursing, which is in the next building to us, to the medical school, to people who come across the river from the other side of the campus where the pediatric hospital is now, and many people from the dental school, and also many community consultants. And what I want you to realize is there's, there's no one that is in this group for fame or fortune. Some of them are relatively well-known people, some of them well-known for reasons other than their efforts in cleft care. Um, but they come because they believe in taking care of our patients, which are both pediatric and adults, although the vast majority of them are pediatric patients. And it is simply one of the most rewarding things that I have ever done in healthcare, and I think anyone, including our dean, who did this at many other places, uh, people become very passionate about. Uh, our clinic has been located at the back of Moose Tower since the building was built, back of the sixth floor. Uh, it came to the dental school after a long history at, at, at uh, Sister Ketty over at Abbott Northwestern. And this came about back in the 1930s when a, a few oral, uh, actually general surgeons got together and decided they needed to take care of these kids in a team setting. And it wasn't that long after the initial clinic was actually set up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So it's one of the earliest programs in the country. Um, the interdisciplinary clinic was formally established at Sister Kenny in 1957. And then a few visionaries back in 1965, who many of you recognize the names, uh, Dean Irwin Schaefer at the time, uh, Wally Warpea Sr., and also Ralph Kirsten, who at that time was the director of the clinic, moved the clinic into the dental school in Aury, uh, right next to where we are now, and that, that building's been torn down, dedicated to interdisciplinary consulting services. These teams have grown through the years. Uh, they started off and they were fairly small groups, but as the complexity of the problem and our ability to care for them has increased, They've grown in number, and this is the typical team that we have at our clinic, and it's not greatly different than we have in a lot of other places. It includes oh, about half medical and a half dental uh, consultants and practitioners. Oral facial clefting is the most common prevalent birth defect, and Down syndrome is a little bit behind it. So it's a very, very common condition. If you lump all the, the cleft lip and palate conditions together, it's about one out of 700 births, but there's a lot of variation we'll talk about in terms of ethnicity and even geographic variation. It is a complex condition. It has not been proven that there's one single genetic component that plays a role, and it's an interaction of, like all complex traits, multiple genetic factors, as well as environmental issues. And there's listed some of the candidate genes. There's been much research that's been done in the last, oh, 15 years anyway, looking at various genetic possible explanations. The environmental factors that are clearest, most clear, is uh, maternal smoking, alcohol consumption, and there seems to be a sense that multivitamins are helpful and particularly folic acid in preventing it. If you have a family member in, in your immediate family who has a cleft, there's a 2 to 4% chance that another child being born will have a cleft. 
And if there's a parent and a sibling, it jumps up to 9%. So there clearly are some familial relationships we're going to look at a little bit later. There is one notable exception, and uh, my mentor, Dr. Soraya Baraghi, told me I had to talk about this condition, and she's taught me much through the years. And the reason is that because dentists can pick this one up, and that's Vanderwood syndrome. And it's known for lower lip pits and clefts of the lip more commonly, but that can also include cleft of the palate. It is an autosomal dom dominant factor related to IRF6, and it has a prevalence of one in 35 to 100,000 births. So you see them, and we tend to be able to pick them up because we're looking in the mouth and we notice these lower lip pits as you see in this patient right here. Many years ago in Denmark, and just like today, Scandinavia had a nice uh, public health system that tracked conditions. And a person by the name of Fo Anderson did a review of pedigrees of people who had clefts that had been tracked within Denmark and discovered after looking at all these clusters of families that there seemed to be two conditions. There's cleft lip with or without cleft palate, and that would show up in one family pedigree, and then isolated cleft palate would be in, a, in another group of people. So that first group that's got the, the yellow bar there is clearly a separate distinct entity from the cleft palate only. When you divide these up conveniently for our memory's sake, they fall into a 25, 50%, 25% distribution. So 25% are isolated cleft lip, cleft lip with cleft palate, 50% cleft palate, only 25%. So we refer to these as cleft lip with or without cleft palate as being one condition and isolated cleft palate being another. A little bit of embryology, just for a second, just to describe the clefts. When we look at the palate and the maxilla, the primary palate is that that's included in front of the incisive foramen and extends up through the alveolus, right about right through the lateral incisor, in fact, distal to it, and then up through the nasal floor if it's completely cleft. And we'll look at that in just a second. The secondary palate is what we traditionally think of as the palate, the hard and soft palate going distally through the uvula. The Vernacular for these, the cleft of the primary palate is we all refer to as cleft lip, and we in the clinic do as well. And the cleft of the secondary palate is what we call cleft palate. So you can have a cleft of only the primary palate, hence the cleft lip. And if it's complete, it extends from the incisive papilla through the alveolus up through the lip to the floor of the nose. And it can be unilateral or bilateral, as we'll see in just a minute. This is a very small cleft, and as you can imagine surgically, you can get a great outcome with something like that. Then you see greater ones that extend up through the floor of the nose, and it distorts and twists the nose. Makes another challenge for the surgeon. And then you can have a child who has a bilateral cleft, and when you look at this, this up in here, excuse me, for those people who are online, uh, I'm looking at this tissue that's forward of the mouth, that's actually the entire premaxilla, which will, should include the incisors. And it's projected outside of the mouth, and sometimes it's actually horizontal to the floor if you're holding the child upright. And there's a bilateral cleft of the primary palate as well as of the secondary palate in this case. Cleft lip only is about 80% of the time unilateral and 20% bilateral. And an interesting fact that's never been very well explained is the majority of them are left-sided. There's some sense that the difference of the blood supply off the aortic arch may have something to do with that, left versus right, but it's really never been very well explained as to why, why that is the case. The cleft lip, can also have a cleft palate along with it or a cleft of the secondary palate. And in that case, it extends posterior from the incisive foramen, and if, if complete, all the way through the uvula, splits it in half. 
in the case of cleft lip with cleft palate. Unilateral cleft lips with cleft palate will occur 70% of the time they will have a cleft palate. Bilateral cleft lips will more frequently also include the palate. And in the case of cleft lip with or cleft palate or with or without cleft palate, there is a prevalence of males over females. There are very distinct differences ethnically. And they're fairly significant and they make a difference when you're looking at where patients come from. And then we tend to think of Caucasians as being about 10 of 10,000 births. Native Americans have a much higher prevalence, which in this state we see with patients coming from the, the Indian populations of the state. Asians also tend to be significantly higher. I think the number here, the Hispanic, that is 40 out of 10,000 is a soft figure, and I suspect it's much lower, and there haven't been quite as many uh, investigations of that, at least in this country. Afro-Americans have significantly less cleft lips with or without cleft pads. In Minnesota, at least to the latest, and I'm sure this is going to be changing, we tend to reflect the, the Caucasian 10 out of 10,000. The cleft of the secondary palate or cleft palate extends just distal to the incisor foramen, and if it's isolated, there's no involvement of the alveolus or the lip, and as we'll see later, this has a big impact on what are the big issues for the team. This shows two cleft palates. The one on the left is a much larger one. The one on the right is a, a partial cleft that catches the distal of the soft palate and, and you see the bifid uvula on either side. And there's a lot of variation, as you can see, in both conditions, cleft lip and cleft palate. The cleft palate only, the rates are much more even. And you see that across ethnic groups, they tend to have less diversity. And in this case, females have a slight uh, prevalence over males. They tend to show a much greater number of associated syndromes with isolated cleft palate as opposed to cleft lip with or without cleft palate. And that's something we have to keep in mind. And it might be as high as 40%. So when we have a patient come in with an isolated cleft palate, uh, Dr. Baragi, who is our uh, person who has a passion for genetics of orofacial conditions, she starts to lick her lips and she's uh, very excited to find out if there's some associated thing going on to explain this. You can also have an occult cleft of the, of the palate and where the tissue looks completely normal, but there's been a cleft that's occurring above and affecting the musculature and a little bit of the tail end of the hard palate. And we call this a submucous cleft palate. Here you see they oftentimes are associated with the bifid uvula. There's a triad clinically that we think of, that bifid uvula. They're, they sometimes have a dark line we call a zona pellucida along the palate. And the thing that pediatricians or neonatologists have to learn when they're seeing a new baby as soon as at, at delivery is feeling for a notch of the hard palate on the posterior edge. And a good pediatrician will, will never miss that, but it, it happens sometimes. Uh, they tend to have a short soft palate about two thirds of the time. They tend to have some velopharyngeal incompetence, meaning the soft palate doesn't close off the nasopharynx uh, from the pharynx with speech and swallowing. And Anna will be talking about that much more later on. There's about one in 1,200 kids. There's no sex predilection. And this is one that can be associated with syndromes that by far the most common is 22Q deletion syndrome. So it's the long arm of the 22nd chromosome that has a section that's deleted. And it affects multiple systems. It can affect the heart. It can affect, well, you can have the submucous cleft palate. It, it can affect vertebral stability. It can affect the immune system. It can affect, um, psychiatric health of the patient. A lot of these kids in their teen years can develop schizophrenia. So if we can catch those things and identify, we can do, go a long ways towards uh, helping to take care of them and explaining a lot of things can be very frustrating for patients who have a child who has this condition and don't know it. The goals of management are what you'd expect. 
we'd like to make these kids look normal and function normal, have acceptable speech, be able to communicate, have a sense of well-being, uh, be accepted by their families and by society. And those of us in, in uh, into the dental situation and occlusion, we'd like to see them have functional occlusions. So that's what the team is going to be working on. And we're going to start this off by talking about early pediatric concerns and care coordination, because that's a big part of it, even above some of the technical things that we do. And Joe Arch is going to talk to with us about that. Joe's been with us about three years, is it getting there? Almost three. And she's made a tremendous difference to the team. She's very passionate about this. She's been very fast learning and she makes a big difference for our families. And I know you'll enjoy hearing what she has to say. Thank you, Joe. Hear me? Oh, thank you. So um, you're probably wondering what a nurse has to do with dentists. And I thought the same thing when I saw that the um, nurse care coordinator position was on uh, an in school of dentistry. I thought it was kind of odd, but um, I happened my way um, into this by um, accident. I didn't intend to ever be a cleft nurse. So um, as you hear a little bit more about my role on the team, it's also personal to me. Um, is there a way I can get my mic? Sorry, just one second. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So, um, I apologize. Picture this, you are, um, pregnant or your partner is pregnant and you finally get to that awesome 20 week ultrasound where you may or may not find out what the gender is and you know it just adds that little step where you you kind of get to know your little person a little bit more you're excited um and you kind of leave talking about what color you're going to paint the nursery and then all of a sudden you get a call from your doctor saying that they can't confirm or deny that your son or daughter is, has a cleft lip or a cleft palate. Um, at this point, what do you think is going on in a parent's head? Um, do they have time before the next ultrasound? It's a level two, but they it's not the same time typically. So they then turn to what? The internet, yes. <laughs> Which we all know the internet is very accurate and provides probably the best information um, so this is what happens. They, they have a baby and this is their idea of their baby. And then all of a sudden they turn to the internet and suddenly these images are popping into their head. Um, and it's not that these aren't beautiful children, it's that they have absolutely zero context into what their baby is really looking at. And they're just looking at a bunch of pictures that can be really terrifying. So. They're trying to adjust to the fact that their their dreams are a little bit changed on top of the fact that they're looking at these things. And I would say that over since my daughter was born, I think resources are getting better and better and the right ones are, are, are more prominent, but you still can find a lot of scary things as well. So why do we want to find these families first? <laughs> because of the internet. Um, the manner in which parents receive bad news has the potential for long-lasting impact on the family's ability to accept um, and adjust to a diagnosis. So uh, fear, grief, shock are often the first feelings that families have. Um, it's very important for these parents to see us because um, they don't know and they have questions and they tend to uh, look and think of the worst things that will happen or the outcomes. So what do we do? We educate the family about cleft and craniofacial disorders and teen care. Um, they often have a ton of questions, um, but surprisingly there are also families that have no questions and those are the families that scare me the most because 
you know they're thinking. They can't not be thinking, but they we I can't gauge where they're at to kind of engage them and, and help them through the process. So those are the families that I work really hard to talk to. Um, some of our other really big goals is just what's, what's treatment look like, how many surgeries, um, different support networks. We have an excellent blog resource from a family on our team who's more than happy to let us share it with families, and I believe families are very blessed by it. Um, and then just support and answering questions. So what questions do parents have? Um, Oh, and backing up just a little bit, like it really does matter if a parent knows something prenatally versus knowing, finding out after birth. So and we see both. Uh, it's becoming more and more common that it will be an ultrasound um, diagnosis and the parents have time to prepare, but when they don't, um, I think it can provide different challenges for them. Um, so the first questions are, what's this look like? Should we terminate? That actually is very something that a lot of parents consider, and and they part of why they want to know if they should terminate is because they have no idea what they're dealing with. So um, they also want to know why did this happen? Did I do this? Is this genetic? Um, otherwise, um, just surgeries. How many of them? How am I going to feed this baby? Um, ultimately, they want to know if their child is going to be okay. Um, most parents feel it's a diff difficult task um, they're to tell family and friends. They, um, they think people will blame them. They think that people will be insensitive to their child, that they will say things that they shouldn't. They are afraid for their child. They're afraid for themselves. And so it's something that we really do talk about. And a lot of times they don't know when they should say something. Should they wait till the baby's born or tell people ahead of time? And um, these are all really good questions, but no, they, they don't really know how to answer them. So those are things that we talk about. And we encourage them, as you can see, to talk to and, and provide a clear picture as soon as they are comfortable and able. It's part of the acceptance process. So, um, The optimal time for a first evaluation with the baby is within the first few weeks. And why do you think that is? of life. I hear whispers. Um, feeding and making sure they're gaining weight and just supporting the family. Um, to touch something. There we go. Um, so we work really closely with hospital staff in order to ensure that um, during the hospital stay that feeding's happening well, that their airways being managed, and that they're ready to discharge. And once they're discharged, they have a plan to meet with us. Um, it's really critical for these babies to gain weight because when we do surgery, um, they need to be able to have surgery and lose maybe a little bit of weight afterwards due to change in feeding routine um, and that not be a big issue. We do try to respect the preference of the mom um, as far as feeding, um, a lot of women are very sad that they won't be able to breastfeed. It's very uncommon that they can, but we do try. If we can support that, we do try to. But part of our job is to model acceptance and show them. Um, and it's not hard. These babies are actually really cute, um, and uh, we really enjoy them. But it's really good for the families to see us and not have. A lot of times, their reaction is like, "Oh, what happened to the mouth?" Whereas we're like, "Oh." This is what we do. This is what we love. And it's really nice for those families to see that. Uh, we talked about weight gain and education. Um, interesting fact, we really do encourage families to brush their baby's teeth early on because they have a lot of surgeries here and they can have an aversion. So there's my dental fact for the day. Um, as far as genetics go, um, nursing does play, a, I think, a, a very key role in, in screening. Things that we look for are atypical facial features um, like micronapia, anomalies of the eyes, ears, extremities, and also we, we look for associated preauricular tags, lip pits, as Dr. Anderson said, um, and epicanthal folds. 
We also look at just other organ function. Is the heart working? Are the kidneys working? Is, are, is there hormonal dysregulation? This, these things are very emotional for families. So as we talk about them and we suggest genetics, many families may or may not want it. And it's our job to A, offer it, but B, also document that they de declined it because it could cause later, later problems. So we, we, we become very close to these families. They think of us as primary care. The problem is we aren't primary care. We can't give their child injections or vaccinations, um, and they need to establish with primary care as well. So some, one of my jobs is to make sure that they get to know their doctor and get involved because we are, we're going to play a key role in their child's lives. So it's really also important that they have someone who takes care of their common cold and flu symptoms. We, we don't have those services on our team. So an interesting, this was interesting to me when I started this job, but we deal a lot with adopted children and families who've moved here from other countries. And um, cultural has a huge effect on how people view a child with cleft. Um, and I did some research online, the Cleft Palate Association did an article that was very interesting, but they found that here was an example, but Hindu people in India believe that a cleft is a result of a sin from a past. Like, so imagine how that child is treated uh, in their society if that is considered a negative thing. Um, there's other religious and cultural beliefs regarding causation of cleft, um, like that it's caused because you did witchcraft or God willed it for you or you did a, a behavior that, that is associated with causal power, meaning you looked at a child who had a facial deformity when you were pregnant, so now your child has a cleft, things like that. Very interesting beliefs, but they really impact our patients. We had a little guy come to us from um, Thailand, and he had a brother and him. They both had cleft. He was older, and I did the initial intake with mom, and she was saying he was suicidal and that he couldn't sleep at night, and he thought all the time, and that when they were there, they said he was very much ashamed of himself, and it, he was just such a beautiful little boy, and his it was, it's really hard to watch how a culture or a viewpoint of how something happened is so shaming. So I, I do love that we live here and that um, it's much more accepting. So our, our biggest goal is that we bring these kids from toddlerhood to adulthood where they can start to ask to be involved in their care. We want them to focus not only just what the parents want, but what the child wants, because ultimately um, it, it's important to have them advocate in their own care. Also, it's not uncommon in our clinics to have um, parents and children have two different um, ideas of what matters to them. So by, by asking open-ended questions and giving the child the opportunity, um, we give them a chance to talk about things that matter to them that might not just be physical. Um, and this is a mom's perspective I found online, but I thought it was very sweet. She said, I will regret that life will never be easy for him, but I love the strength of his character that it has built. I have never known a braver, stronger, gentler, friendlier, or more fun-loving, easygoing six-year-old. I love how he brings out the best in every single person he meets. I love that he reminds me to be so thankful every single day because, like all people, I tend to forget. I love that he has proved to me that there is still a lot of good in this chaotic world of ours, if you are willing to open your eyes and see it. I love that he has taught me to respect and admire people with disabilities instead of feeling sorry or embarrassed for them. But most of all, I love that he challenges me every day to be a better person. I have never loved anyone like I love my son, but I don't love him better, I just love him differently. And even before he could speak, he taught me more than any other person it ever has. And I won't lie and say it has been easy, but I will spend the rest of my life remembering his amazing smile that is big enough to reach all around the world which is my blessing in disguise. I'd like to give a big thank you to Anna and also um, Wendy Lohman. They helped me prepare the slides. And this is the little one that I get my perspective from. So thank you. Thank you, Joel. I, could, I think you can see what Joel has brought to our team, and, and it's a whole lot of com compassion and connectedness with our, our patients. Um, 
Early surgical care is, is in most cases related to lip and palate repair, and there are many ways that this are done, and different surgeons have different perspectives on it. Um, there, there are, in this state, uh, these surgeries are typically done by a plastic and reconstructive surgeon, or there are a growing number of pediatric ENT programs who, who have uh, an experience in what they call facial plastics, because as you can see, there's probably a turf issue there, and there is a bit. And so we have both types of surgeons on our team, and uh, they, they both do some excellent work. Um, the lip repair itself can be done in a few different stages, but it usually happens within the, about three months of age. Um, it can be done with or without NAM, which I'll just make briefly mention here. It helps feeding in many cases, uh, but the biggest issue without question is the sense of, of social bonding and get, gaining acceptance. Um, and it's, it has a downside to it, is because we'll see a little bit later, it can affect maxillary growth when you do that repair earlier on. But I don't think there's anybody in this country that would accept not having their child, or, or accept having their child wait to have their cleft lip repaired until they were six, seven, eight years old. You know, we, we just don't feel comfortable with this. We do it earlier. There have been some efforts to try to do these things earlier and earlier and earlier with the presumption that the, the healing will be better and the scars will be smaller. There have even been some you know, sort of outlier attempts to do these things in utero, and maybe someday we will do that because the, the scars are non-existent if we could pull that off. But there's basically too much risk to the child, at least at this point. And so we tend to wait till they're growing and thriving, and it ends up happening at about three months of age. Uh, this is something that is done and that some surgeons really appreciate and others say, I don't need it. And that's an attempt to close the cleft together, both the lip, the alveolus, and to modify in some cases the nasal cartilage so that it will make it easier for the surgeon to do the repair. There are people who are extremely passionate about it. It's the only way to treat people. It has a very positive side because it gets the parents involved. They have to take these appliances in and out and clean them and re-tape them back into place. And then they have to go in periodically to get them adjusted as, as the soft tissues begin to mold and are moved. Um, but the downside is it, it's, a, it's a big job. It's a big job for the parents. They gotta be committed. They gotta have to understand what they're supposed to do. And it's a big job for the practitioner who's providing that care because you've got to be available 24-7. And typically this is done in most cases by pediatric dentists or orthodontists. Um, and as I said, it, it, it's a, in the world of cleft care, it's one of those things that's a real hot topic at times uh, because of how passionate people get about it. And uh, so that is something that some of our surgeons like and, and is provided for them. Uh, this is a child with a bilateral cleft lip, as you can see. And there's the repair a few years down the road. This is, I won't say they all look this great, but this is a really nice one, and we have some great surgeons. And they, they turn out some amazing things at times that uh, it, it just sort of blows you away. One of the interesting things, and actually Joe told me about this, and I've actually heard mothers say this in particular, um, there's a sense of, of guilt sometimes that happens on the front end. You know, this was my fault. I did something wrong. Even feeling guilty because they aren't bonding with the kid the same as they did with another child that maybe they had. But the one that's the most surprising is there, there's a sense of mourning that mothers not uncommonly go through after the repair because they missed their child's smile. They've, they've grown to love that child with that cleft and all of a sudden they don't look like they used to look. So there, there are many different things that parents go through along the way. And, and of course, the other thing is both parents sometimes aren't looking at things the same way. And sometimes it's really hard to get them to understand the perspective of the other person. The palatal repair um, takes place usually the same surgeon, either a plastic surgeon or a, a facial plastics ENT surgeon, usually about around a year. And this one makes a big difference 
for speech and for feeding, probably bigger than the lip does. And it has a whole lot to do with language and speech development that, as Anna will be talking about in just a minute. So holding off on this, and occasionally we get adopted children, and we actually just had a recently a, a, a child from the state here who was, what, two and a half, I think? And, she, and they finally detected that she had a, a cleft of a soft palate. In fact, it's a soft palate with the, the little uh, incomplete cleft at the posterior edge of the, of the palate with the bifid uvula. Um, and it got missed. And finally, somebody thought something isn't seeming right, and an ENT uh, surgeon saw her and said, wow, there, there's a cleft there. And, and so things get missed. And in that case, that child's at tremendous risk for having problems with speech and language development. Um, what we're going to talk about next is Anna's going to come up and talk about speech and hearing and feeding because it, it's the same parts of the system. These only happen in kids with cleft palate, even if it's with the cleft lip or it's cleft palate isolated. And uh, just a few words about Anna. Um, I have learned a whole lot about cleft care from Anna, and she truly is a resource for our team. She's uh, outstanding as our clinic coordinator and tremendous as a speech language pathologist. So please welcome Anna Thomas. So thanks for being here tonight. Um, I am really passionate about this and really privileged to be here at the University of Minnesota with a wonderful team. These pictures are um, a trip I took in Peru with um, w one of the surgeons, Murray Christensen, um, who I admire greatly. It was kind of a dream come true for me. Um, and so I'm going to just talk about um, feeding and communication and hearing being a part of communication. So if we think about just around the world and throughout the lifespan, good nutrition is core to our health. Um, it's really a global health need. Um, communication, including speech, language, and hearing, um, it's essential and important to our daily function as human beings. It's how we build relationships. It's how we function academically, socially. Um, furthermore, really eating and communication add tremendously to our quality of life, to our satisfaction. And so both of these are issues in the care of cleft and craniofacial um, that are important. So the degree of feeding and speech and language problems depend on the diagnosis. Okay, and then you can see a range here. The severity, and there's really this complex interaction between various factors, including bi biological factors, environmental, the learning factors, um, and we could really go on and have a really great discussion, and those are the discussions we have around the team conference. Um, so, and not only around the team conference, but with the parents, the family, the providers, and the community. So, so um, from the care document from the American Cleft Palate Association, um, we know, and as providers um, and people living, we know there's a very high risk with for speech and language disorders with craniofacial anomalies. And so it requires careful planning for treatment um, and especially close communication for the surgical and dental management because there's this complex interaction. And if we do that, we will optimize the outcomes. Okay, so what are the problems associated with the different types of clefts? If we think of an isolated cleft in the primary palate, and so the cleft lip, um, including the alveolus, 
they're unlikely to have significant speech problems related to the cleft. Um, they can have other speech and language problems um, that the general population may have. Um, they need the functional lip repair in order to develop normal speech and feeding. They're most at risk for speech sound distortions and problems because of the dentition and the malocclusion, so missing teeth, et cetera. If they have a fistula, there can be nasal air emission and feeding problems, nasal regurgitation from that. If there's a cleft of the primary and secondary palate, a cleft lip and palate, the main issue that you'll hear us talk over and over about is velopharyngeal dysfunction um, that can persist even after the palate repair because of scarring, short palate, and so forth. They can have speech sound disorders, so articulation problems, phonological problems, and there are multiple factors such as hearing and the velopharyngeal dysfunction that cause those speech sound disorders. They're also at high risk um, for language disorders, so particularly not um, being able to express what they want to say. Um, there's been several studies, mainly out of Iowa, showing a 35% risk for neurocognitive disorders, um, particularly um, with cleft lip and palate, and more so in boys, um, and that includes language. There's a lot more research to be done in that area. It's pretty controvers controversial, um, but we know there's a risk particularly for ADHD, um, memory issues, auditory memory, and we don't know why, um, if it's related to anesthesia or inherent in the um, disease. So let me give you a little primer in speech, okay? So if we think in um, feeding, both communication and feeding rely on normal anatomy, and it's a feedback loop that works very synchronized together. Speech, um, being the oral form of language, um, begins with the diaphragm pushing air out, up from the lungs and activating our larynx, okay? So that air sets the vocal folds into motion um, so, ah, okay, we're vibrating, um, and that produces that sound, okay, and then that sound is shaped by the supralaryngeal structures, so the soft palate, the tongue, the lips, okay, so, ah, ba, 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 okay, and it's only going to be strong if I have velopharyngeal closure, okay, and so, in children and adults, individuals with clefts, we're mainly um, concerned about velopharyngeal closure. Um, and so you can see in this picture on the right of the screen, the velum is at rest. It stays at rest um, when we're breathing and when you say M in an ING. Okay, and then on the right, the palate elevates when we swallow, and for all the sounds besides M, N, and I, and G in every single language, okay? And it has to go up and um, contact the posterior pharyngeal wall. The lateral pharyngeal walls move in, and a tight seal is achieved. Um, there's different closure patterns, but the key is there has to be a really tight seal in order to have normal speech and normal swallow. Okay, so when there is not a tight seal, you have a leak, it's called velopharyngeal dysfunction or velopharyngeal inadequacy. And there's lots of different terms, um, but we'll keep it basic. What it happens is that you um, have too much nasality on vowels, which is called hypernasality. You have weak pressure 
So instead of getting blah, it, blah, blah, I can't build it up. And then you get rushes of air, which is called nasal air emission. And um, oral consonants, blah, and duh, turn into nasal sounds because that valve is not closing. So by Bobby a puppy turns into me. I saw too. I saw too. I saw too. Okay. And so um, here is a child with a repaired cleft palate, and that palate is probably scarred and too short, and so it can't reach that posterior pharyngeal wall. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. And from sixty to seventy. Sixty one, sixty two, sixty three, sixty four, sixty five, sixty six, sixty seven, sixty eight, sixty nine, seventy. Okay. And now say mom and Amy are home. Mom and Amy are home. Puppy will pull a rope. Puppy will pull a rope. My baby a bib. My baby a mim. Okay, so she has kind of that whole constellation or sequelae of velopharyngeal dysfunction. So when um, you hear that sequelae, that is a structural problem. Speech therapy can't fix that. If we were to plug her nose, we would hear an instant improvement. You would get oral airflow. Um, and so that's when we know we have to physically improve um, her velopharyngeal mechanism. And there are surgical and prosthetic options for such a severe problem. Um, and so things we think of, we want to, um, we would do imaging. And so this is um, a team assessment, a speech language evaluation, working with a surgeon. Um, and a prosthodontist or a dentist um, and an ENT. And so we would get imaging, a nasendoscopy, and assess what does, is the muscle functioning? What does the length look? Um, do we have to re-repair the muscle? And we look at how is the mechanism moving and plan that surgery, and um, what is their medical status? Is surgery a good option? There's multiple surgical options, including a superiorly based pharyngeal flap, um, a, a sphincter pharyngoplasty, um, and there's um, historically and even today, people talk about augmenting the posterior pharyngeal um, wall and in doing injectables um, such as fat. Um, and all of these have their risks and benefits and um, less or more evidence. Um, we have to individualize it. The goal, if you look at this picture on the right of the screen, or yeah, we want to, if this is what we see when they're talking, this is the soft palate, this is the adenoids, um, this port needs to close and obtain a tight seal. Um, so we need to make that happen when they talk. And so um, one of the very long-standing surgeries is a pharyngeal flap. Um, and so that same view you saw previously is up on in the right-hand corner. This is a pharyngeal flap. And so instead of one large port, we now have two ports bilaterally um, and create a bridge of tissue. And so this is great when the palate is inadequate, it is too short, we connect them and the lateral walls will move in. Um, this is a cone beam CT scan that's been sectioned and you can see how it's just this bridge of tissue now connecting and here's coronal section, you can see 
is these nice pores. And so what we want to see that it's at a nice level. Um, so kind of makes it easy to picture it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. This is a picture of a palatal bulb, um, and this is um, another option for um, physical management. And this can be done with a prosthodontist, a pediatric dentist, an orthodontist. I, uh, as a speech language pathologist, I love to work with anyone who is willing. <laughs> and it just takes a team. And this is um, great for anyone who is a, uh, not a surgical candidate or um, doesn't want to undergo surgery. Patients have had multiple failed surgeries. Sometimes we use a speech prosthesis to make them a better surgical candidate or to train out of um, a speech prosthesis. Okay, so um, you can see here um, the bulb, and we're filling in the velopharynx. And but it's best to make them gradual um, and build them up over time. Um, so that's kind of an overview of the velopharyngeal inadequacy problems in cleft lip and palate. Um, one of the um, and about 20% of children and adults with cleft lip and palate will have um, velopharyngeal inadequacy that requires um, management. Um, I would say about 75% have a speech sound disorder, uh, and that's because they are learning to talk, they start babbling when they have an unrepaired palate, when there is an opening between the oral and nasal cavities. So they don't have a place that they can learn to articulate their sounds. They also have fluctuating hearing, um, secondary to chronic otitis media. They have eustachian tube dysfunction. And so um, imagine learning to talk with no good place to put your tongue and with plugged up um, ears. It's an uphill battle for them. And so research has shown that kids with cleft lip and palate selectively avoid consonants that require them to um, contact the hard palate. They prefer extreme sounds of the vocal tract. And that was a study done by O'Gara and Logaman. Um, most of the studies in speech for cleft lip and palate describe the sounds they make. There aren't a lot of studies that tell us how to treat them in therapy, um, but I think the studies are so descriptive on the sounds because they're so creative. So the sounds, and if you hear them, you'll, you'll agree that they're, um, I'm in the AmeriCleft Speech Project, which is one of the um, first major outcome studies in the North America um, that's looking at outcomes for five-year-olds. And it's modeled after the UK outcome study. But it's taken us about five years just to be able to reliably be able to transcribe the speech because they're such complicated sounds they're making. So sounds they make are called glottal stops, pharyngeal stops, and fricatives. And so like for puppy, they hear uh e. Um, I want a puppy would sound like I want a uh e. Um, and so pharyngeal stops and fricatives. So chocolate chip cookie would sound like huh, 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 um, so and they never do it the same way that each time. So mid dorsum palatal stops are really common if there's a fistula and they're trying to speak around it. Um, 
really common in kids with Piero band sequence. Um, they'll make clicks and everything. Nasal fricatives are my favorite because they're really easy to fix and um, they're really creative. They sound the same as nasal air emission, but they're learned. Um, so I see the sun um, would sound like I see <laughs> the sun, um, but they put their lips together like an M, I see <laughs> the sun. So it sounds like the person needs velopharyngeal surgery, but they actually just learn to shoot the sound through their nose. Um, and how you can tell the difference is you plug their nose, I hate the huh. And they've actually just used the back of their nose as the place of articulation. Versus if they have BPI, I see the sun. So it's pretty, I think, an awesome job that I get to figure this out. And it's even better that I get to work with surgeons and dentists to figure it out. So the other thing that um, the cat of malocclusion, sorry about my spelling, just keeping you guys awake here. So, there are um, other structural, we call them obligatory articulation errors associated with cleft lip and palate um, because of anterior cross bites, um, really common, um, especially um, some of the kids, they've had so many surgeries um, or it's in their family. Um, so they have severe cross bites and it makes what we call lingual alveolar sounds. That's the place of articulation. So it sounds like T, D, S, V, really hard. Labiodental sounds, F and V. And there's things we can do in therapy to um, teach them to compensate in a positive way. So someone with uh, anterior cross bite, they will um, will teach them to make a reverse labial dental. So for F and B, we'll teach them to take their um, lower central incisors to their um, upper lip, for example. An overbite can make it really difficult to get um, lip closure for sounds like M, P, and B. And so we'll teach them to put their upper teeth to their lower lip. Um, so, so this picture just kind of illustrates kind of the hazards that can um, be posed to articulation. And this is where it's really helpful to have those conversations around the team table to know, um, you know, if a child is going to be having maxillary expansion, what sounds should I maybe not work on in speech therapy? Um, or if it's going to, if a child um, is going to be um, having bone grafting soon, will we be close, then we'll be closing the fistula, or if that is several years off, Maybe we can obturate it um, if it's really causing a problem for speech. So those are the decisions that really do impact speech and require close um, collaboration between surgeons and dentists. Um, the hearing status of children with cleft lip and palate certainly impacts their communication development. It can impact their academic performance, their social function. And so um, we know that individuals with cleft lip and palate certainly have their share of hearing and middle ear problems. Um, here is um, a picture of the middle ear. The ear is divided into three parts, the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. So it's the middle ear that individuals with cleft have 
difficulties with, and that's because of the East Station 2 problems. The East Station 2 um, connects into the throat and inserts right into um, the muscles, go into the soft palate. And so it's that eustachian tube that, you know, is normally closed, but it's those muscles um, connecting into the soft palate that help it open and ventilate. And so if it can't ventilate, the fluid builds up and they can get chronic otitis media. And so it's the tensor really palatini that's responsible for um, that opening and closing and equalizing that middle ear pressure. And so they can have um, just chronic eustachian tube dysfunction. Those infections um, can, I would say nearly 100% will have chronic ear infections through early childhood that can lead to um, conductive hearing loss. So it's really important that the audiologist on the team is involved. Um, it's recommended that their hearing is monitored every six months. Um, studies have shown that kids who have fluctuating hearing loss have language delays and cognitive delays. If we factor out the hearing, they don't show those delays. And so we're aggressive placing ventilation tubes. Um, if um, it's not done, they're at very high risk for clusteatomas. Most of these problems resolve by age five to seven. Um, they can have long-term issues with tympanosclerosis due to chronic infections, multiple sets of ventilation tubes. If they have tubes in that for too long, they can have perforations in the um, tympanic membrane that can lead to persisting hearing loss, um, which will need to be addressed as well. So I wanna wrap up with talking about feeding. Um, feeding um, in a newborn requires two things in order to be uh, to suck, at least the oral phase. One, you have to be able to get that seal with the lip. Um, or I think I add, sorry, three things. I added the lip because I have to advocate for that lip repair because insurance companies like to deny it, believe it or not. <laughs> so three things, lip, and then you have to have that intact alveolar ridge in order to compress the nipple down um, and to release the fluid. One of the most important part, parts is having that palate intact in order to create negative pressure. And that happens as the jaw opens. Um, and so in order to do that, you have to have velopharyngeal closure. If you've ever had, um, if you use a straw and there's a hole in it, um, you're doing everything right with your lips and your um, cheeks and you're sucking, sucking, sucking so everything looks right, but there's a hole in it and it's a waste of your energy because nothing's coming out. That's what it's like for a baby with a cleft palate only to try to feed, um, breastfeed or with a regular bottle because um, there's a hole in it and you won't get negative pressure if there's a hole in it. And so everything looks all right um, because I have the ability, um, but not the negative pressure. And so that's why we use special techniques like putting them upright um, and special bottles. Um, the Haberman, um, the bottle in the middle has been the most popular and used for a long time. You, you squeeze, we are expressing it to make up for that velopharyngeal dysfunction. The newest and greatest is the one on the far right, the Dr. Brown. And it works similar, it has a valve in it and that valve makes up for that baby not being able to get that negative pressure. And all of these um, 
the goal is the same, that the baby doesn't just um, do okay, that they feed normal. The early um, feeding skills will help speech. Um, we know babies with clefts have poor oral motor skills, and so normalizing feeding is really important. So breastfeeding isn't really possible if there's a cleft palate, but it is possible if there's a cleft lip. Um, we tend to think about feeding only with um, babies, but I just want to say it can really be something um, that affects adults too. Their occlusion, if there's a fistula, if they have DPI. So if you see adults, we need to think about how they're functioning as well. So we have to understand how their structure, um, how they're learning and everything goes together. Okay, this last part of the uh, active care is where dentistry gets most involved, and it's typically for clefts of the primary palate or cleft lip, and particularly when the alveolus is involved. And dentally, these kids can be missing teeth, they can have supernumerary teeth, there's some evidence that they have increased caries rate. Um, here you have a panorex, and if you look carefully, up in the area of the um, left side between the uh, primary central incisor and lateral incisor, there is a lack of, uh, or excuse me, look at the right side. There's a, an extra tooth up there. And so there's a supernumerary lateral incisor, and we see that all the time. We have to decide which of those two teeth is, is likely to be more viable. A very common condition is no lateral incisor which has a growing belief that that is actually a variation of a cleft lip, it is just missing a lateral incisor. It's a lesser uh, form of the condition. Uh, teeth can be displaced, and here you see the lateral incisor, which is actually in the cleft, and it's displaced palatally. Um, the primary dentition, as I said, there's some, some evidence of increased incidence of dental carriage. It's kind of soft evidence, I would say, but if, if it's there, it's most likely because of um, behavior is more difficult to clean sometimes. And as was referred to by Joe earlier on, these kids can develop oral aversions, which are very difficult to treat. And they just don't want anyone anywhere near their mouths. So trying to clean their teeth is, is not a very easy thing. Uh, this is from the, the missing malformed malposition supernumerary teeth. Uh, was done by a paper here at the, the University of Minnesota, and it's been shown in other places, the, the numbers of these things that exist with clefts. And then there are, of course, missing teeth. You always have issues with space maintenance. And typically on our team, the pediatric dentist is taking uh, the lead role with most of those things. There are, there are two things that happen with the maxilla which are extremely common. In fact, um, there are cases without both, but usually there's a hypoplasia that affects both the width of the maxilla and the AP projection of the maxilla. And so they tend to be deficient in maxillary width and have a mid-face deficiency. And this is what happens a lot in our clinics and orthodontists, and we have a few in the room who've taken part uh, with our team, and I, we owe a lot to all of them, just like our, all of our consultants. But at some point, a decision is made to expand that upper arch. And as you see here, a couple different appliances. Um, it's a fairly quick thing because there's no suture. You just push it on apart and hold it stably. If you take the appliances out or don't provide retention, it goes right back. But what it is setting up for is to do an alveolar graft. And that cleft of the dental alveolar ridge is probably, in my observation and my experience with the team, the single most difficult surgery to do that is involved in cleft care. And that's that alveolar graft to repair the cleft alveolar ridge. 
Uh, and our team is typically handled by an oral maxillofacial surgeon. We also have one of our craniofacial surgeons who does it as well. And, and I would say we have some superb surgeons who've got a great wealth of experience and do a great job doing this. But even with the very best, there are times where it doesn't take as well as we would like it to. So they take a situation like this where you've got a cleft, and this would be, I would say, a, a short putt for most of our surgeons. Um, but you can imagine when they become extremely wide, they can be 10 millimeters wide, and trying to graft some bone in there. Um, the process is shown in this cartoon. And what you see is going around from A to D is first of all, they, these clefts are much always, and I've heard this many, many times in Jim Swift, they're always way bigger than they look clinically. And it's true because they tend to be funnel shaped going up through the floor of the nose. So they've got to find the tissue to create a closure of the nasal floor or else it'd just be going packing bone up into the uh, nasal cavity. And the, the standard of care in most centers today is a graft from the iliac crest. So they take cancellous bone from the hip and they pack it up into there. And then they develop all sorts of interesting flaps to close it on the oral side as well. If successful, you cannot tell that that child had a cleft of the alveolus. They look normal. Um, it becomes a tremendous challenge when it's a bilateral problem because there just isn't enough oral mucosa to work out all these flaps. So it, it can be a very, very challenging um, surgical procedure. The timing of it is determined for the most part by the status of the teeth in the area. Is there a lateral incisor there? If not, you may wait a little while. Is there another tooth that's, that's on the way into the cleft, the canine, for example, and you feel like, oh, we got to get in there and graft sooner. So we, we assess the, the teeth, and I will say, when I first started out, uh, we had the comb beam even at that time, but we probably weren't as aggressive, and some of the patients who'd been there before, um, it was a, a panorex and a clusal film. And trying to make a judgment about where these teeth were based on the angle of projection of those radiographs. I, uh, honestly, I give people who did this before cone beams all the credit in the world. A tremendous challenge. Cone beams have made this even still challenging at times, but we really get a good three dimensional feeling for where the teeth are, how they relate to the cleft, and it really sets things up nicely. Then we run into the permanent dentition, and there's often crowding, displaced teeth. There's, again, issues of space maintenance. We may have to continue to work on arch width discrepancies. And then there are these AP issues. And this is the purview of the orthodontist and the oral maxillofacial surgeon in working out whether they need to have an orthognathic procedure, or can they do a pro uh, protraction face mask, a reverse face mask, to pull the maxilla forward if it's a young enough child. The teeth, um, along with sometimes missing, you get these diminutive peg laterals, which are very common. So the restorative dentist or the prosthodontist plays a role in making those look like normal teeth. And in this photo on the top, number seven, the right lateral incisor is a peg lateral that's had a veneer put on it to build it up to make it look the same as the contralateral lateral incisor with the same mesial distal dimension. It is not an uncommon thing. In fact, there are some centers that do this almost exclusively. UCSF is one and, and has a very strong cleft craniofacial program where they will simply close a space and do a canine substitution, put the canines into the lateral incisor position. And depending on the occlusal status, it can be a great outcome they don't have to go through replacement of missing teeth. Um, and you see that in the lower case here where the lateral incisors or, or the canines are in the lateral incisor position and they've been disguised to look like lateral incisors. And, and the nice thing is you don't have the additional surgeries that, that go with if you move on into implants. Um, previously, it used to be a case where the restorative dentist or prosthodontist would do something and it might be a removable prosthesis more commonly fixed. Um, I would say every time I see one of these coming into the clinic, I kind of cringe, honestly. 
The reason is sometimes you've got mobility between the segments and you're actually putting, they put the bridges across the cleft so the bridges will break or come loose and get recurrent carries. And so I would say nine, well, way over nine times out of 10, we get adult patients in our clinic. We're the only cleft team that takes adults in the Twin Cities. And so way over nine out of 10 times when they come in, it's with a dental concern. And the dentist doesn't feel comfortable trying to figure out a replacement for the bridge, and, they, and so they come in, and, and they can be very, very challenging. So the standard for replacing the missing lateral incisor, if you save that space, today is, of course, dental implants. It's a bit more challenging than anterior implants, which could be challenging enough. But those of you that do uh, restorative and, and place anterior implants, trying to make them look aesthetic, you also have to deal with the fact that you're placing it into the previous alveolar graft. Sometimes there's good continuity of the alveolus, but there's not enough volume or maybe not enough height. So you have to do some sort of block graft before you do the implant. So you, you can see how it becomes a very, very challenging thing for the uh, restorative dentist and the oral surgeon. And, and I tend to, to push that the oral surgeon who did the grafting be involved in that implant placement because I've seen enough of these. They are not your typical cases, and it's good if you have someone who has knowledge of the site uh, when they're going back in there. Now, this tends to happen as they're older and, of course, when growth is complete and near as we can tell because of wanting to uh, limit vertical growth. So what do we do in what order and at what time? And some programs are very... You know, this is when we do this, this is when we do that. I, I would say without question, we tend to do this based on the patient. But this is a, a sense of the protocol, the lip repair at about three months. And as you can see, there's various ways that's done depending on the surgeon and the size of the cleft. Uh, palate repair, nine to 12 months. Again, there's some different options there. It is not uncommon to have a lip and nasal revision and most of our surgeons like to do that before kindergarten when social things because it doesn't always look completely natural and there can be some deformity that can be improved on. We try to limit those revisions as much as we can. You'll hear horror stories and we see hear them every week when we have clinic of people coming in and said, I had 17 surgeries, I had 25 surgeries. And you can imagine for a surgeon trying to go back in and improve on something with scar tissue and blood supply, that's basically a mess, and it's very hard to improve on. So if you can limit these things and pick your spots when you're going to do revisions, it makes a great difference. The grafting at ages eight, five to nine, and later on comprehensive orthodox to finish up, and many of them will have a final septal rhinoplasty at the end, and especially after any jaw surgery that might be needed to correct an AP discrepancy of the upper jaw. These are the kind of associated things that happen. About a third of them do have orthognathic surgery, usually with some form of a maxillary advancement. The secondary speech surgeries that Anna talked about, the ventilation tubes, almost everybody, especially with cleft palates, the fistulas sometimes need to repair. Uh, sometimes, and when doing those flaps that Anna talked about, we obstruct the airway and we're wrestling with obstructive sleep apnea in the kids. And so you're, you're kind of trying to give them better speech, but not block the airway and compromise so they end up with apnea. Uh, the secondary blocks, and then their genetics can be dissolve, the neuropsych. Um, so there's a host of things. And I think the really take home message, uh, message is, there are two. One is every one of these kids and their problem is unique. There's no cookbook that can work for every single person. Just like most other things we all do in healthcare every day. The team gets together, and I put this up as a summary. My predecessor, who's in the photo there at the end of the table on the left side, Carlin Muller, and Carlin, many of you know, he ran the program for 35 years from the time he was a graduate student until he retired. Um, he wrote a paper that summarized some things about team care. And it was about access, timing, support, and all the things that Joe talked about. But what was really important is mutual respect. When people walk in that room, the egos are left at the door. And I can say with our team, without question, they are. 
And when there are conflicts, and there always are when you've got strong personalities who have opinions about care, we fall back on the patient comes first, what's best for the patient. And it is a very rewarding way to take care of patients, and in my mind, it's the only way to take care of these people. Thank you much.